computer. I mean, it'll be a computer for all 10 seconds until it melts or it shuts off. Okay. All right, are you ready? Because I'm ready, I'm ready to make a video. What's up guys, Jay's Two Cents here, and today we're gonna do a somewhat of a talking head, but maybe actually look, because I, I have props, I have props to show you. I got props, bro, props. I take that back, I apologize. Today we're gonna talk about features that you actually need in your computer. This is for those that are like building computers and stuff. If you already have a computer that's built and doesn't have these features, well, you should go buy new stuff so you have these features. With no parts markup and only a $75 build fee, Redux gaming PCs are the obvious choice for gamers who demand the best without paying extra. With as little as a few clicks, you'll get a PC optimized for you and the games you play at a price that fits your budget, and all Redux PCs are backed by a two-year warranty. To see all that Redux has to offer and to start configuring your next PC, head to the link in the description below. So I got my notes here because I actually took notes on this one. I want this to kind of seem like structured in some way. Um, but anyway, we're gonna start with the motherboard because here's the thing, motherboards, although, you put all the cool stuff on there, right? You put your cool cooler on there, you put your GPU on there, you put your NVMEs and your capture cards and your sound cards maybe and all your fun stuff, but the motherboard gets forgotten all the time. But it's a motherboard for a reason. It controls everything and it's kind of the unsung hero. And also in terms of control, it has a lot of the feature sets that we're gonna talk about uh, on it. it. It provides a lot of the, the features that we're gonna talk about today. So first and foremost, something you absolutely need is some sort of a diagnostic. Now there's three different ways that you'll find diagnostics implemented onto a motherboard. The most basic being an LED readout, which is where you'll often find uh, on the side, usually it's on the side, sometimes more in the middle or towards the very bottom, it will have a tricolor LED where it will either be red, yellow, or amber, or white, and what that does is it will have a section for GPU, it'll have a section for CPU, a section for RAM, and then usually an okay light under that. So when your computer is booting, it goes through a POST, which stands for Power On Self Test. And what it's doing is it's saying, okay, do we have a CPU? Is it talking back? Sweet. Now all this is controlled by the BIOS of the motherboard and it's communicating with everything attached to it. So it goes, hey CPU, you there? And the CPU goes, yeah, I'm here. And it goes, what kind are you? I'm this kind. Okay, cool. We're talking, we're working. So then it will go, from a yellow LED as it's testing to a white LED, maybe to a green LED saying, okay, we're working. If it doesn't pass that portion of the self-test and it turns red, it's like, hey, CPU, you there? <laughs> Which happens sometimes. Like for instance, if you have a, uh, a motherboard that has, that's newer than say, or older than say a new CPU, like 5000 series AMD, and it's the early versions of the X570. It might've been like, hey CPU, you there? And it's like, I'm a computer. Well, what kind of computer are you? Yeah. Then it will turn red and you'll know, like we're not getting past CPU. The same thing happens with the RAM. The same thing happens with the graphics. Uh, and then once it goes, we got CPU, we've got RAM, we've got graphics. That's the order they actually do it. Then it will, everything will turn green and you know you're good. Now. One step beyond that is the little Q code reader, which is the little, uh, where it has the two numbers on the top, usually in red, sometimes orange, depending on the brand, or white in some brand. That will actually correspond with an actual number because when it's doing a power on self test with the CPU or the RAM, it's checking multiple things. Like I said, hey, are you there? Yeah, what kind are you? Cool, is this cool? Yep, that's good. Okay, we got your micro code, we're good to go. It tests a bunch of things during that process. And the Q code readout, if it fails or stops on something, it'll pause and it will just show that number. Unless you're getting into a, a boot loop and you can see where it's boot looping, what number it hits last. You can correlate that with the manual, which will tell you exactly what failed. So that becomes extra helpful. The most helpful that takes all the guesswork out of it, honestly, is the OLED style. And those are, all, those are gonna be found on the more expensive motherboards. The types of diagnostic we're talking about here kind of come in a small, medium, large in terms of price sets. The more expensive motherboards typically have an OLED screen on them somewhere. Um, Asus kind of pioneered this and a lot of brands are doing it now where it will physically tell you on the motherboard, you know, load GPU uh, BIOS. Like sometimes the GPU isn't loading the BIOS into the motherboard and so it's not communicating, you know, you have a GPU problem. Or it'll say CPU detect or memory detect and you'll know exactly what's failing. So diagnostic tools, especially for a beginner, are a must have, in my opinion, even as a power user, because sometimes you just, you wanna know what the heck is failing. Because in the old days, yeah, back in like the 1900s, as my daughter likes to say, Dad, did they have color TV back in the 1900s? She actually asked me that. In fact, my youngest daughter asked my, my wife the other day if when she was a kid, if she had to write a letter by dipping an ink, or a feather in ink. Okay, anyway, moving on, I'm not that old, guys. These are just nice features to have. If you're trying to troubleshoot what's wrong, especially if you have a first post that won't work, 
then at least you'll know exactly where you're getting stuck. Something else that I think is very important, which kind of is segued from that diagnostic, is a clear CMOS uh, button. On cheap motherboards, you see how they have all these pins standing, standing up? These are for things like USB or front side connector, you got your fans. You would also have one called clear CMOS, which was just two uh, prongs sticking up with no jumper. You'd have a little plastic jumper you'd put on there, turning off power to the power supply, putting the jumper on there, holding it for 10 seconds is how you would clear your CMOS. But more modern motherboards now will actually have buttons on the back side, like we see right here on this Asus Maximus motherboard, which gives you a clear CMOS button. And it's actually lit up green, so it's easy to see. You just push and hold that, even with the system powered on, because the motherboard knows when it's being cleared. So when you push that, it will actually remove the, the battery from the power loop. That way you can clear the CMOS, which will allow you to just reset everything to factory settings. This is really useful if you're trying to play around with overclocking, if you're trying to maybe play around with RAM timings or RAM speed, and you get to a point to where you can't get back to your BIOS simply because you can't make it past the actual CPU or memory initialization, which means you can't get into your BIOS because it's not you only get into BIOS once you have a good post. And if you can't post, you can't get to BIOS. That's just a quick, easy, convenient way to reset everything without having to take the side panel off, get a flashlight, get the manual, because sometimes it's not labeled CMOS. It's like JP02 or something like that. And you're like, what the heck is JP02? And you're looking for it or JF01, right? So you don't have to get the manual out and you're like, crap, I lost the manual. You have to go online and hopefully you have another computer or a phone or something to find the manual to look it up. Just push the button, it's super easy and it's on the backside. At the very least, I would like one on the actual surface of the motherboard. This one down here at the bottom has not only a safe boot button, which basically puts everything into like a known configuration that will boot, and also a clear CMOS button in red, makes things nice and easy to just push it, hold it for a few seconds, let go. Everything will probably boot after that if it's something you messed up in BIOS from playing around with overclocking. Speaking of surface mounted buttons, as we're talking about, so there's like flow to this, right? See, that's why I have notes, people. Surface mounted power and reset button is a really nice feature to have because when you build a computer, we recommend you bench test everything. Set it on the box, plug in the basics, put in the graphics card, CPU, cooler, and that's it. Just, you can, oh, and RAM, and you can get the system to boot up that way by making sure everything works before you go through the trouble of building your system and then go, uh-oh, it's not working. But if you don't have a surface mounted power button and you're a beginner, you're gonna feel awfully skittish trying to take a piece of metal or a nail or a screwdriver to jumper the two front pin connectors that say power to bridge that connection to actually force the motherboard to turn on. So it's nice to just know you could push power or in this case it says start and then reset if you want to be able to get it up and going. It also means if you wanna do some sort of a custom build or a test bench or something like we do here where it's not in a case and you don't want a power button on, you know, wired somewhere, it's right here on the motherboard. It's also a really quick way to diagnose if you have something wrong with your front panel connectors. If you're pushing power on the case and it's not turning on, but you push power here and it does turn on, then you know something's wrong with either where you stuck the front panel connector pin itself or the button or the wire in between. So again, just really useful feature um, that makes things really easy to kind of uh, take a lot of the guesswork out of the troubleshooting. Now, speaking of the uh, clear CMOS button, like we were talking about a second ago, one thing that's really nice to have that, uh, again, I know this sounds like an ASUS sponsored video. It's truly not. It's just, I feel like ASUS kind of pioneered a lot of this stuff. And that is going to be BIOS flashback. Now, here's the thing. One of the sketchiest, scariest things for a newbie to do is to flash your BIOS. You got to go online and get the file, plug it into you or put it on USB, plug it into the motherboard, go into the BIOS, go into the flashback utility that's built in, load the BIOS, and then while it's writing, which depending on the motherboard and the complexity of the board can take either 20 seconds to two minutes, that's that vulnerable window. That's where a sudden random brownout happens and power goes off. Or your, your dog or your little brother or whatever accidentally pushes the button on the power strip and turns off your system. If you shut down your system while you're writing to the EEPROM, which is what the chip is that contains the BIOS, Nine times out of 10, you just brick the computer. And if you can't get back to it with the EEPROM not having or having incomplete data on it, the system will not post. Now we're way past the days of having removable chips to just plug in new ones. That's, that was something you used to be able to do actually with ASUS motherboards, like my Crosshair uh, formula back in the day, I bricked the BIOS. My cousin had the exact same motherboard. So I used his chip, put it in the motherboard, fired it up. While we were running, it no longer accesses the EEPROM. It only does it while it's booting. Physically took tweezers, took the EEPROM out, took my bad one, put it back in, did a flash, and I was up and running. You can't do that anymore. However, with many motherboards now having single BIOS and not dual BIOS, a BIOS flashback utility is awesome. You don't need a CPU into the, into the motherboard. You don't even need RAM. 
everything is handled just through the EEPROM on the motherboard. As long as you have the 24 pin plugged in, you can put the BIOS flashback uh, BIOS on a USB into the BIOS flashback hole on the, it's labeled on the back of the USB. Shut up, Phil. It's a port and you call it. It's a hole. hole. It's a USB hole. <laughs> your USA hole, Phil. <laughs> There's one on here that has a square around it that says BIOS, that's your flashback utility. All you have to do is put the flash uh, drive in there, hold the BIOS flash button on here until it starts flashing, and guess what? It will then just read the BIOS and it will start flashing itself and you're up and running. That is a very useful feature to have when we're talking about motherboards. Uh, just kind of an honorable mention here, which I feel like it's features that you need, is plenty of fan headers. The cheaper motherboards, they save money everywhere they can, not just in the PCB layers and the features built in, but also the amount of headers that are on the motherboard. Anything that has to be soldered in somewhere is extra cost in terms of manufacturing. A lot of times you'll find some of the cheap motherboards may have a CPU fan header and maybe one or two chassis headers, and you've got a case that's got six fans. What are you gonna do? Why well, are you gonna use splitters everywhere? Well, if it's a cheap motherboard, it probably isn't gonna last very long because they use uh, low quality components on those headers, which means they'll burn out over time because the amps are too high or if you run them too near their amp limit. So having plenty of fan headers on a motherboard is definitely gonna be useful if you wanna run a lot of fans in your case and be able to control them. Let's talk about graphics cards. Not a whole lot of features to really talk about here, but there are some things to talk about. Having a cooler is usually a good one. I just thought of that right now because there's no cooler on this. This is one of our 30, this is one of our 3090s that we just kind of test with, you know, and I like to sand the die and play around with lapping and stuff. Um, no, high power limits are nice. When it comes to GPUs, um, I'm the kind of person that likes to push them as hard as I can. Moving the sliders in MSI Afterburner is never going to hurt the card, but allows you to pull some extra performance out of it. If you are hitting power limits and you can't move the power limit slider very far or it's locked entirely, then you're gonna be very limited on how far you can push it. So a nice feature to have are the overclocking based graphics cards which allow you to have a higher power limit slider. Um, the other thing is gonna be multi-fan for whether it be two fans or three fans rather than the old school blower style or real basic fan design because uh, you want to get as much cooling to your graphics card as possible. If you're the kind of person that's like, I don't care about noise, I want maximum cooling, then you'll want the big beefy tri, you know, triple fan axial coolers. That way you can get as much airflow over the die as possible, which will give you more overclocking headroom. But also those cards usually have a feature that's very important to many people for silence, which is a zero dB function, which means when the card is not under load, the fans turn off entirely, which helps with a couple of things. One, less dust buildup in the, in the graphics card when it's not doing anything. Two, it also means absolute silent operation, again, when it's not doing anything. So zero dB is usually something you'll find on modern coolers that are, that are multiple axial fans. Um, but I feel like that's a function that is important if sound is something that's important to you. The uh, other thing is, again, when it talks about BIOS, a lot of custom cards these days have dual BIOS on them or a dual BIOS switch. Some even have three now. That's a must have to anyone that's interested in getting into BIOS flashing for obvious reasons. If you flash a BIOS and then it bricks the card, you can get it up and running by jumping onto one of the other BIOS. Load the, the card, get it running, flip the switch back to the bricked BIOS, and then flash it again like I just said I did with the motherboard. It will always bring it back. Uh, this is also for people with 30 series cards that are playing around with grabby other manufactured BIOS that have higher power limits and such. Sometimes you'll find one that is not compatible and it might brick your card. If you don't have a multiple BIOS graphics card, don't flash the BIOS, period. That is just a smart move because if you have a single BIOS card and you brick it, you more often than not will not be able to get it back. All right, so a couple other honorable mentions here, things that are nice features to have uh, for your storage. Let's talk about storage. An absolute must these days is having at least a SATA SSD for your operating system. Look, I know a lot of people are gonna argue and be like, I don't wanna run SSDs, they're too expensive, I wanna run a big hard drive. Those are people who've never experienced an SSD because trust me, once you've experienced even a SATA SSD, even an old one on your operating system, you are never gonna go back to a hard drive. Just the boot times alone, the snappiness of the system on a SATA SSD and the fact that you can get like a 500 gig SATA SSD now for like $70, $60, something like that. 480 Kingston for 55. There you go, a 480 gigabyte Kingston for 55 bucks, right in the target range where I was thinking. And your system will be much faster than, faster than you've ever experienced if you've never had uh, an SSD. Even if you have an old system that you feel is really slow, you'd be surprised how much of that speed 
or lack thereof is actually happening because of the hard drive itself. If you're talking about getting SSDs, then uh, a real nice thing to look at obviously is NVMe SSDs. One, there's no cables running to them. You don't have to run a SATA power. You don't have to run a SATA cable. That means less clutter in your system and less failure points. They're mounted right to the motherboard. Every modern motherboard ever since the, well, I get about ever since Ryzen came out has NVMe slots built into them. You'll be able to mount it, no problem. You can set it and forget it. Your system will be faster than you've ever experienced. Game load times are absolutely insane. We're talking SATA drives capping out at about 550 megabytes per second, and Gen 4 PCIe's capping out at almost 6,000 megabytes per second read-write speed. So you can do the math on, what, 10 times faster than a SATA drive when it comes to modern NVMEs. The best hard drive I ever had was actually the, a Western Digital Black that was doing nothing. It was sitting as a secondary drive that I ran like crystal disk and stuff on, and I saw about 190 megabytes per second read-write, which is really fast for a hard drive. Typically, they're anywhere between like 80 to 110 at the most. All right, last but not least, let's talk about power supplies. Another area where I feel like an absolute must-have feature set is a modular design. A lot of these features you guys might have noticed add cost, but you'd be surprised what that extra cost can do for the aesthetics of your build, just the, the cleanliness of your build and the, the pride you'll feel in that build when you're not looking at ketchup and mustard cables, you're, you can remove cables you're not using, set them in the box, put them in the garage or whatever. That way you don't have extra SATA plugs running around, Molex plugs, which are going to, non-modular power supplies have to have every single plug that you could potentially need. So you're going to have probably two strands of Molex cables sitting there all stuffed in the bottom of your case. Um, you're going to have long cables that aren't needed. So you can unplug what you don't need, which makes it very, very nice. Not to mention modular cables are always black. Either they're sleeved black or they are just a, a solid black flat cable. They look better than ketchup and mustard with the nasty dominatrix fishnet looking mesh on there. <laughs> yeah, it's important. The other thing that may be important to you if you're that person that was also like, I want zero dB fans for your graphics card would be a zero dB fan mode for your power supply. When the power supply is not under load, it's not generating very much heat. It's really not. When your system's sitting there maybe pulling 120 watts at idle, the graphics or the, the power supply fan doesn't need to be running. So just like your graphics card, when it goes under load and starts noticing an increased amp draw, then it will ramp the fan up and down based on its own internal temperature or thermostat that will control the fan. Not to mention any fan that's not turning when not needed is not moving dust into your system. So another must have feature, obviously, zero dB uh, will help keep things nice and clean. So that's pretty much where my list caps out on when I'm building a system, especially for someone else, feature sets that I think are must haves. What I wanna know now is what is your must have feature for your computer? What can you not live without when it comes to building your computer? Put it down in the comments below. Guys, check out other people's recommendations. Maybe they put something cool down there that I didn't think of and uh, maybe it's worth noticing. So upvote your favorite ones and we'll see who gets the top pick there. As always guys, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next one.